This is the Tame Aperture Podcast. Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. <laughs> Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. I read you. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. Come on down and jump over this shit. You can't always have a hand. Sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Welcome to the Tame Aperture Podcast, where we talk all things movies from first-time directors, indie films, art house, and much, much more. Today on the podcast, we talk the international film, Kronos. Antique dealer Jesus Gris stumbles across Kronos, a 400-year-old scarab that, when it latches onto him, grants him youth and eternal life, but also a thirst for blood. The film was released in 1993 and was written and directed by Guillermo del Toro, making his feature film debut. It stars Federico Lupi and Ron Perlman. I'm Gabe Vienendahl, filmmaker, film instructor, and movie enthusiast, and I'm joined, as always, by veteran podcaster and editor, Alan Martindale. Alan, how the hell are you? Good, man. I, uh, I got HBO Max. Do you have HBO Max? I've been considering, so I have HBO, the app, like the right. HBO. Right. But now Max is a whole new deal. Yeah, it's a, it's a whole other thing. They actually, they have some really good stuff on there and they're going to start premiering films on there. So I got it just um, kind of to keep up with the time. And I think, actually, I think I got it for free with my cable package because I already have it. And if you already have it, you probably get it too. Um, I only do the HBO app, right? Like okay. regular, I don't do the cable package. Gotcha. Gotcha. It's like, everyone's divvying up their stuff. It's too much. It's we're, we're going to be so fractured with all the streaming services that we're getting to a point now where it's, it's going to be pretty soon. If it's not already more cost effective, just go with cable. Like That's it's crazy because, and, and I got to say this, I called this like eight, nine years ago. I said, eventually all the different channels will just have their own thing and you can subscribe individually to those channels. And then you say that, and it makes me think that's funny because if it becomes so fragmented and separate, then eventually it'll be easier to go back to a cable package. It's, it's crazy. I mean, it, it's good because like with Comcast, I get, I get Peacock and I get HBO max cause I, I subscribe to HBO. And so I get, I get some stuff with it, which is nice. Um, but the only reason I mention is because is this movie was actually on HBO Max. So there's some okay. good stuff on there. It, it's worth checking out. Um, I'm glad I didn't have to pay for this movie. Uh, cause it's not it's not like it's a bad film. And, and we'll talk about it, obviously. But Alan, this is going to be the shortest podcast in temperature history. I was thinking about that. I was watching this movie <laughs> and I was thinking, I don't really have a whole lot to say about it. Um, I chose it just because... Uh, First time director. First time director. It was it was Del Toro's first film. So uh, I was kind of looking through and just trying to see, you know, what are some some features that we haven't hit. And uh, I like Guillermo, Guillermo. I can never pronounce the name. I like Del Toro a lot. Um, I am a little embarrassed to say I'm not overly familiar with his filmography, but from what I've seen, I'm I'm more familiar with um, things that he's produced, and I read his. Uh, his one of his his books, uh, the strain that he wrote with Chuck Hogan years and years ago, and I remember liking that a lot. And so, uh, I, I, but uh, film wise, I'm not I'm not super familiar with things he's directed. I've seen Pan's Labyrinth, which I liked a lot, um, and that's about it. I I'm really embarrassed to say I I never saw The Shape of Water, which is is really that's embarrassing crazy because is we're in the same boat because I never I never saw it. I hear it's fantastic. I mean, it won Best Picture, so obviously it's got to be good, but um, never saw it. Is that always true, though, just because it wins Best Picture? No, I didn't like the artist. See, I liked the artist, but I think I liked it for the classical homage to what silent film was. And as a film historian, like a guy who's the buff of history, like I liked it for that. Um, but I could see why you wouldn't like it. It's similar to like, I hated La La Land, hated it. Oh, I see. And I never saw La La Land either. So and I can't remember. I think it won Best Picture, but I hated it. Absolutely hated it. And a lot of and a lot of people loved it. And it just it's just like Hollywood just spewing all over itself. And with 
<laughs> See, that's kind of what I felt like for the artist. I mean, there was a good story there, but it just it just felt like too much. Look at how cool this idea is we have, you know, it just. Yeah, there's a little bit of that. But I think what what I came across for me was I love the guy and I forget his name. I love the guy who acted in it. Yeah, so he was he, great. He forgave it for me. Like I was able to follow him and then let go of the pretentiousness in that sense. Yeah, yeah. 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 I see what but, you're saying. And I think La La Land, I think, wasn't that the one where Warren Beatty announced La La Land and it, they didn't actually win it? I think Moonlight won it. Oh, I think you're right. There was that flub. Yeah. And I don't know why he did that. I was can't it Warren remember. Beatty and Annette? No, not Annette Benning. I uh, can't remember who it was. It was, uh, oh my gosh, Chinatown, Jack Nicholson. What's her name? I can't anyway, remember. I can't yeah. remember. Now I feel yeah. dumb. But anyway, uh, I digress into that. Yeah, I never saw, you think about Del Toro's work and like you're, you, you, you say a lot, uh, you said something about a book he had written, which didn't cross me. I didn't know that, but he has written a lot of screenplays too. I think he's a hell of a creator and a storyteller. I don't think there's any, so I want to preface going into this movie that I actually, like you, have not admittedly seen all of his work. Um, I love Pan's Labyrinth. Love it. It's, I don't know how you, you can watch that and not, and not be enamored by it. It's I mean, fantastic. That is the personification of masterful filmmaking. It is a great is. movie. And to me, that embodies kind of everything that I know about del toro is that he loves the monsters but he yes. loves the the humanity behind it and the heart behind it right. and that's what to me that's what was so cool about watching chronos because you could see i mean from his first feature you can see this is him man this is his style this is everything he loves there's horror in there but there's a lot of heart um and that's kind of that's his signature and i remember the first time i saw pan or actually not the first time i've only seen it one time but when i saw it um, I remember thinking, I thought it was going to be a horror movie. So I went in and, you know, me being the, the horror geek I am, I went in thinking it was that. I was I about halfway through the movie. I was like, all right, this isn't a horror movie, but I'm starting to fall in love with this film. You know, it's tragic and, and heartfelt and sad and amazing. And some the monsters in that movie are fantastic. The guy with the, the eyes in his hands still gives me nightmares. Fantastic. Yeah, his creature creation is unbelievable. It really I mean, is. It really is. And even look, even in this film, which which has not a lot going for it. <laughs> Very true. Um, is uh, even even kind of at a at an early stage in in a new filmmaker. I mean, you see that you see the ability to kind of create uh, special effects and kind of like craft craft like go about making and putting the movie together. So I didn't feel as though uh he's it's a it's a bad movie but i also didn't think it was a good movie it's one of those movies where i just sat neutral the whole time i wasn't even sure where to go it, it i don't know if i've ever watched a film that made me feel more neutral ever in my entire life than this one which is it, it, i just didn't feel anything really it's here's here's how i could sum it up and then we'll start getting into it more but I looked at a lot of the either movie poster art like the one sheet art or the concept art and it's awesome right like even that piece of art you have behind you on your tv screen with the, right. yeah with this it, it's cool and like inside the creek like it's all very cool but the movie itself um it leaves it leaves a lot to be desired in this in a sense um and he tries to tie in some emotionality with the young girl and the, the grandfather but I was just confused uh, in the set, not in the storyline, but like, what are we trying? It's the first, it's what's funny is we talk about movies and each, each week we try to give our message, our interpretation of what the movie is. I don't have one. Same. I, I, I don't, I think it is. I think it is what it is. It's a, it's a story. It's Del Toro. I think um, finding his voice, although he's further along than a lot of filmmakers we've, we've covered uh, on their first features. And that's, I mean, that's the fun of, of this is, is you came up with the idea of first time filmmakers and, and going back and seeing some of these legendary guys and, and, and women who have made their first feature and see how much they've grown. And that's the fun of it, right? And, and so for me, seeing this, he is, the, the skills aren't all the way there 
technically he's great conceptually he's great the story's just not quite there it it just doesn't have that punch um but his voice is is pretty close to fully formed as i know him from the film from the few uh films that i've seen of his yeah when you're talking about being able to create the atmosphere right the world the surroundings essentially the vibe the aura of what the world is right. he's great at that but in terms of a heartfelt like attachment to the characters i didn't feel a whole lot in this particular film and it actually reminds me of the other film that i've seen of his um aside from like the he did hellboy and then of course we talked pan's labyrinth he did pacific rim which i actually never saw either i didn't uh, either i know it got a lot of either hate or love on either side I, I I recall people talking about Pacific Rim as a uh, the monsters and the 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 robots and things are very cool in terms of conception. Uh, he also wrote the Hobbit series, right? That and so like I think he's a he also did one that um, that I watch with my kids called Troll Hunters on Netflix, which is an animated series and it's awesome. Like as an animated series, it's so awesome. It's one that both adults and kids can enjoy simultaneously. And we loved it, me and my kids. So he's this great builder of worlds. And in this, in this film, the world's there, like you were mentioning, but it's just not the character involvement and the plot, which usually we can take plot. And in some ways for me, because I like the character stuff, last week we talked No Country. That's a totally character driven. There's plot in it, but it's totally character driven. The characters and the plot, I don't really, I don't get behind so much on this particular movie. It's interesting you say that because I totally agree 100%. But I'm looking at this and I'm, I'm kind of breaking it down. I like the characters. I'm not enamored by any of them. It's got some great moments. It's got some great acting. Uh, like we said, the atmosphere is good. The, 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 the effects are good. So I don't know what the missing link is between all this because it, usually when you go down the list and you say characters are great, acting's great, and we, go, and we do all that, usually it adds up to a pretty damn good film. And so, and this isn't bad by any means. Like we say, it's, it's just kind of, it's just there. It's just there. It, it is what it is. And there's, there's nothing deeper. Um, I will probably forget about this within two weeks. Yeah. And, and one of the notes I put was like, I think as a concept, like conceptually it has legs, which is like, if you think about the scarab and the, the idea behind the little monster inside the scarab and it can give eternal life and immortality, like premise wise, there's some legs there. I just think not the world, but the tone of the plot and the narrative was built soft. Yes. Yes. I agree. hundred percent. I think darker would have been cooler. So I, yeah, yeah. Even darker. I mean, think about Pan's Labyrinth. I mean, it's scary and dark and it's, it's, it's deep. It's, and I think I would have liked to have seen him go a little bit darker and deeper with this. Run us through this narrative, just this basic concept for those listening that may that haven't seen it, which I imagine, to be honest, is probably a lot of people because right. they, have, they haven't watched this movie. Um, run us through the start of this film and kind of the, the timeline of the narrative. Well, first of all, I want to I wanna make sure I get credits for choosing Criterion Collection. <laughs> I, did, I did notice that as it came up they they put know, it in their collection and i was like oh I, we're in for a treat and then I know. the treat never came and and it which is weird because also the reviews when i was looking at it because i was looking at first-time filmmakers and you know I, I tend to go horror kind of lean lean on that so i was just kind of looking and, and poking around and the reviews are really good on this so i was like all right this is you know it's del toro and i, I think we're gonna like this so it's it's kind of surprising um that it could be the, all that well-liked criterion collection and just fall so flat. But, um, but it, I think it's a cool idea. So it starts out. Um, I, I can't even remember how it starts out to be honest with you, but basically you, you've, you've already put it in the back of your, it is. I watched it today, like today. It's not like I watched it a few days ago and it's already leaving my brain. It starts uh, out with that alchemist who's developed some kind of device that he's called Kronos and inside is some living organism that basically gives the idea or not get does literally gives the, I don't want to say eternal life, but damn near close to immortality. Yeah. Yeah. And basically and what did you, what, what is the, this a, a cerebrum? Is that what you called it? I thought it's called a, 
I thought I was wondering yeah. if I even pronounced it right. Because I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I didn't even know. To me, it's just a little device, little wind up device. Yeah, I just call it a scarab. S C A R A B. Yeah, scarab. Yeah, scarab. Um, and, and inside it, like you said, is, is a little creature. We don't know what it is yet. And um, we see a vampire straight up, like from the at the beginning. And, and he looks cool and he looks scary and he looks old. He looks like old Dracula essentially see and so this I'm is where i got confused already i'm gonna jump in because i didn't even pick that up until later i didn't initially go are we talking about vampires here i didn't that didn't cross my mind and when you say it now of course having seen it oh yeah that guy seems very vampire like with the stick right. to his heart right? right and he's it's the by the way is that alchemist who developed the scarab this device the chronos um but I didn't pick that up until later. So you picked that up a lot quicker than I did. Well, I knew I, I had read a little bit about this, that, that it was a different kind of vampire tale. So I kind of already had that in the, in the forefront of my mind going into this. Um, that was the only thing that kept me going, Alan, was I was so confused the first 30 to 40 minutes about what's going on. And right. finally, I started to put a few things together that they have vampire like qualities. And I go, oh, he's bleeding in a Dracula type of, right uh, storyline in, in its own twisted way not twisted but own different way right um so and then we cut to a family uh, a, a grandfather his wife and, and a granddaughter who's i'd say you know six seven years old and these are our main protagonists and she the, the granddaughter and the grandfather have a very close relationship. They're, they love each other very much. You could tell uh, the, the granddaughter, and I'm surprised they didn't build on this anymore. It's, it, I, I sensed a little animosity there between the granddaughter and the grandmother. Oh but yeah, it, absolutely. There's a little bit of, of uh, bitterness between the two. Right. But to me, uh, unless I missed it, which is entirely possible with this film, uh, they kind of just let that go flat. But I think that was an important moment because later on, you, I really did feel for the uh, for, for the granddaughter. And I can't remember what her name. Again, I, I have no idea what the characters names are. Um, so I have no idea. But I did feel for her. Uh, and then Ron Perlman shows up. And I don't know what you thought about Ron Perlman in this movie. But for me, he bugged the shit out of me. He was so annoying. There were times where I couldn't stand him. And then there were times, there were a couple moments where I was like, I love him. Right. It's a, right. It was a weird back and forth. There was a lot of inconsistency in how he was portraying what he was portraying. He's just, so, such, a, he's just such a weird dude. And he's so weird looking that I almost feel like he, I don't know how much range he can have. And not necessarily because he's a bad actor or lacks the skill, but just because He's so unique looking. He looks like Bigfoot. Like he looks like Harry and the Hendersons. Yeah, he's got a weird physicality yeah. to, 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 to what he does. He had some lines in there that made me laugh so hard though. Yeah. Um, and it may have been the, the absurd way in which he delivered them. But uh, we'll get into that because I have a couple lines I want to read. But I, I do like what you're saying because actually what's funny is, man, we're really uh, syncing up on this here because I wrote that in my notes, which was, the young girl has this animosity toward the woman at breakfast, which is, I assumed is her grandmother, but she likes the old man. And I thought there might be something there that he might play into. And you're right. It never really uh, evolves past that for me, mostly. Yeah. I was, I was surprised. He would think that that would continue, but, um, but I mean, the, the old man really does kind of take the granddaughter under his wing and she follows him around everywhere. And, you know, I have a daughter, so it, it really kind of hit home to me. And I thought that was a, a cute, heartfelt relationship they had. And really the driving force between the, for the entire film. Like, as far as I'm concerned, if you don't have that, this movie, there's no point in watching it whatsoever. Yeah, that's the one thing I would agree with is like, look, if we're not going to, I mean, and even it's, I think it's still pretty soft. Sure. Oh, absolutely. The build of that, it, it gets lost halfway through where, the girl just kind of doesn't come back into the movie for a period of time. Right. He's out doing whatever he's doing. And then she comes of course back in at the end, but you're right. If that gets, if that gets lost in there, then why did we make the, Why did we make this movie? <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, so the, the old man, he, he owns an antique shop 
And uh, he has, I don't know how he came into the possession of it, but he has a, a, a statue that is that Ron Perlman and Ron Perlman's uncle are, they're, they're searching out. And they find, when, when, they, when, when the old man discovers the statue in his shop, he and the granddaughter are kind of poking around with it and bugs start coming out of the eye. And then uh, I, I kind of like this, this shot when the, the little girl's just smashing those bugs with the book. I thought that was funny because she knew what to do. She's like, get rid of those things. Exactly. The grandfather jumped up, but she took care of it. Um, but then they take it apart and they find that little, the little scarab. And it's, it is like a, almost like a cockroach shell. And it, it's made out of metal. And it's almost like a wind-up toy. And the little claws come out and they, they, they stab the grandfather because he's holding it in his hand. They stab right in his hand. And um, that basically injects him with this, this serum or whatever it is to, give, to, to, to make him become a vampire, essentially. And then the rest of the film is, is, is really just him progressing through this, this transition into being, becoming a vampire. And one thing I think that they, that they should have spent more time on is we find out later that there are actual rules quote unquote rules is what they call it in order to be become immortal and and basically it's from what i understand it's just drinking blood uh but they don't really die, delve into that and they don't really play up the importance of that because there is i i think if they if they play that up a little bit more the uh the antagonistic relationship between the old man and ron perlman and Ron Perlman's uncle towards the end, I think would be heightened. I think it'd be, we'd have a little bit more driving force. And I think we, we def, I think we'd want to know more, but to me, they kind of just, they, they set up these rules that don't really matter all that much. Yeah. They're irrelevant. I mean, they don't yeah. really have a, you're right. Cause the ending to me and, and is so blah yeah yeah very well said i didn't care i didn't care at all in the build-up but getting to that ending which we'll we'll surmise in just a second but getting to that end there were some moments in there in his stages you know you had mentioned basically and that's really what it is now that we're using that the the discovery of this plot device or this this little uh like we said the scarab that's the 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 key point of interest in the story now, like, what is it? Uh, we kind of know what it is because it gives exposition, but what's it going to do and how is he going to evolve in his stages? <clears throat> and it's, there's a couple scenes in there that are just off. Like once he starts to discover the potential of what it is, he starts praying to it and then stabbing himself. It's just like, there's no clarity in the real power of this thing. I didn't understand entirely what made it so i mean I, I didn't get it it was like why what, we're, what, miss, what, there's we're missing pieces yeah we're missing pieces there's a lot of information that's that we're not getting here because he does it is almost like a drug where he, he goes into the bathroom to stab himself with it and then he he's he kind of gets his fix and it what is that like it, the way I understand it you get stabbed one time and then you can become immortal right if you follow the rules that are never explained but for is some it, reason, is it sucking it. the blood from him or is it injecting the blood from the bug thing inside into his body? I, the way I understood it was it's injecting him, but I don't, I, who knows? And why is he doing it over and over again? Cause there is a scene later once he injects, he, he clamps it onto himself and it, it grips onto him. And then there's these shots, which I think were cool shots, which were taking you inside the bug. So the bug's only like four inches by four inches wide. It's pretty small, right. but like he takes you inside the mechanism and those were kind of cool shots. And you see, it's cool that he lets you see the creature inside of the, the device. Creepy. Uh, creepy looking too. Yeah. And then once again, that's, this is where he's going to, He's going to catch your interest because I think he's good at building those monsters. But but I wasn't sure there was a moment it, towards one of those scenes where you see the bug almost begin to grow, like mm -hmm. get, get a little bit of energy. So I didn't know if it was like sucking from him or giving back or like, and then you see the wills of the in, inner workings of the device also like reversing. 
So I didn't, I didn't understand what was going on. I was confused. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot going on there that we're not, that we're not privy to. But I would say this is where he, I, I, this was, I, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more into this, this mythology of this thing. It was kind of cool to, to see what powers it had and what it did basically gives him like revitalization, like a new life. He's young again, his wife's all the, all the, all the things that you think about by, by kind of returning to your glory days, so to speak, he's not old man right. anymore. Yeah. He, he shaves off his old man mustache and he's, you know, he, he's feeling vibrant and they go, he's dancing with his wife and it, it, it feels like he's kind of getting another lease on life. And it's, it's a lot of fun to watch. Uh, it is addiction, I guess, in that sense, there's something there thematically that's saying, Hey, he's sure. now addicted to this thing. That's giving him a new life. Sure. And, and Ron Perlman keeps showing up. Uh, he keeps showing up. And, and uh, my favorite part, and I, I'm guessing that your favorite part with him was when he, when his uncle was calling him on the, on the phone or the walkie talkie or whatever it is. Oh yeah. That was great. That was, funny. that was awesome. I laughed. That was funny. Cause that's, I mean, that I've never seen Ron Perlman really be funny. Um, I'm not, I, I haven't seen a, a ton of him, but I've never really been, you know, a Ron Perlman guy. I've never really been someone who's like, I, I just think he's fantastic. Uh, he was good in Sons of Anarchy because I think he fit that part really well. But everything else is just like, eh, I take him yeah, or leave. Even then, in Son- which is a great TV series. I love Sons of Anarchy. He, uh, he still, he's good. And you're right, he fits that role. But I mean, he, he's still not the catalyst behind that behind that series i still feel like charlie hunnam's like he he he's great like he if you look at their performances i think his performance is like awesome and you're right ron perlman just kind of like there feeling that that characterization which is so weird because he's if you look at him he he looks like an imposing figure and he's not a bad actor it's not like i'm saying he he doesn't have any acting skill he i think he's a great actor but for some reason he's just kind of like uh i i don't know it's just i don't care that scene though, where, where his uncle calls him. So basically he's, his, he's his uncle's errand boy. He he's kind of waiting around for his uncle to die so that he can inherit whatever possessions his uncle has. Right. And his uncle would call him periodically and say, get up here. I need help. And he just, he back talks him off the line. And that, that seems very funny, but yeah. it's not, it's not my favorite one. And we'll get into that one. Okay. And it's the dumbest part part of it too, but but uh, we'll get into that one. But I think he's just kind of. I mean, I think he does good for me because he's different in terms of like what the anticipation of the story is. Like the story is kind of following this old man who who runs across this device and now is like kind of has a yearning to to have eternal life or it kind of has vampire like qualities. Ron Perlman's kind of the the contrast to that, and it makes it it makes it kind of funny for me because the other thing that he does here is and it and it plays into that which is like the mix of the languages like you've got the old man speaking spanish in the the location of this film takes place in mexico and then you have ron perlman who's speaking english yeah that was interesting but he's, he does speak spanish at some points but not really but i i did think it was interesting that they were kind of going back and forth I think that's a hard one to pull off. I will give him credit for that. I think that yeah. pulling off multiple languages in a film, uh, I think it works. He, he, made, he made it work somehow. I'm not sure what it was, but uh, he made it work. Um, I got I to gotta ask you this question because we're getting, you know, we're talking about this, the old man whose name's Jesus, um, who's the old antiques dealer who's got the device and now has been injected by, by this uh, love, not love, but this immor- immor- immortality. Um, they go to a party, right? They go to this party. He's feeling good. He notices a man with a bloody nose. And the man goes to the bathroom and Jesus excuses himself from his wife dancing and follows the man into the bathroom so he can lick the blood off the floor. I thought that was funny I, because the whole, I mean, the movie is, is him transitioning into this vampire character and they never explicitly say it's vampire. Right. And this is, I bring, this is where I finally went, Oh, this is how long it took me 30 right. 40 minutes was to go, Oh, he's a, 
he's got vampire qualities. Some right, like when he got injected or quote unquote bit by the device, it changed him, and now he's kind of vam. He's like a vampire. Yeah, because the the sun hurts him. Um, I think that's about it. That's it. I mean, there's one that's moment it. where where he goes back and the sun burns him. Right later on, a few a few scenes later on, that licking off the bathroom floor was disgusting. Though I'm sorry, that was disgusting because he was he was gonna get it. Um, th- this is a part that I, I kind of laughed at, but I also thought it was kind of stupid. I laughed, and it was also disgusting. Well, because the guy goes in and he bleeds in the sink, right? And and so then the, then the guy who's bleeding leaves. And he's about to actually lick the blood off the sink and off the counter. But then some dude comes out of the, the, the stall and just like spilling, like every time I drink, I have to pee so much. And just like saying the weirdest, like too much information shit, like you could ever say. And, and not only that, it was so disgusting. Why did he clean the blood off of the sink? The guy that comes out of the stall. If you were in a bathroom and saw a pool of blood on the sink, I'm not going to use my bare hands <laughs> right. to rinse the sink off of somebody else's blood. It bugged no. me so bad. I was like, that's disgusting. Well, who is this guy, first of all? Second of all, um, he, he comes out with his pants still down. The whitey tighties, some jock yeah. strap on. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's like a jock strap. He is uh, xenophobic, saying the most xenophobic stuff you could say. Uh, about foreigners coming to his party it's just like who what what is this guy i don't understand what this is and then he starts cleaning the sink with his bare hands with someone else's blood like he owns a place or something or like he's a custodian it didn't make any sense to me we got a health and safety issue with yeah there, someone's blood there's a lot going wrong but i i did i mean if you're gonna do that at least it was kind of humorous but then there is a little bit of blood on the floor after this guy leaves and so uh, Jesus gets on the ground and licks it. And I like this shot because it was actually all in one shot. Yeah. And the guy comes out of the toilet. Uh, he, he says his little diatribe. He cleans the blood off the sink. He leaves and it's still one shot. And then you just, you see hey, Jesus go down on the floor and start licking up the blood off the floor of the bathroom. And it's disgusting. And then I like, because you see uh, foot, you see feet walk in the bathroom we're still on Jesus. He doesn't even seem to notice it because he, he's almost um, in ecstasy, eating this, drinking this blood, licking this blood off the floor. And then it's <laughs> just a swift kick to the face. And he's out. I, see, I loved, I thought this was a cool shot, a cool little sequence. It didn't I make noticed, it, but I liked it. I noticed, well, I mean, it got us to the point of him getting knocked out and then leads us into, oh, it's, uh, it's Ron Perlman's character who's, uh, tracking down Jesus because he needs to find the scarab for his uncle. Right. Right. But you're right. That shot's great, which is, and it, what, what Del Toro does good. And I you noticed that in a couple pieces throughout this film is it, that camera movement's great. So, you know, first time filmmaker, like the ability to kind of walk through a scene in your head and then understand how you're going to dynamically move the camera like I give it, and there's a couple shots in there. That's one of them. There's another one on the stairs. It's not as strong, but his camera movements, uh, pretty solid, especially for his first go at it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can see he's got the chops already just yeah. story wise, yeah. which is interesting because he is so good at building stories and that he's, he's made a career as a writer and as a producer, like he's so good at, at, uh, creating stories and, and moving us along in them. And so that's why it's interesting to see that that was his weakest point in his first feature. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is in the, the, a little bit of a, of a, a career contradiction in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so then he's with Ron Perlman. He's uh, they're in a car. Ron Perlman kills him. He, he him over the edge of a, they did yeah. it. They, that shot was cool because they used a real car and they filmed the real thing falling 100 feet off a cliff. That was yeah. Like- and it was kind of funny seeing Ron Perlman trying to, um, and his character's name is Angel, by the way. Yeah. So I'm going to start calling him Angel because getting tired of saying Ron Perlman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Angel's trying to push the car over the thing and it gets stuck and then he does his little football. Like he's got some comedic moments that really work and I think are kind of funny. And that was a little bit of insight into that character. So I thought that was kind of cool. But he does. He he pushes uh, Jesus off off the cliff in the car, 
Um, then everyone thinks he's dead. That's it. That's he it. should be dead. And then there's a, a fun little sequence uh, at the at the uh, the is it mortician at the mortician place, the uh, the Undertaker's place, where they're getting him ready for his his viewing. They're preparing the body, and I like this little character, this the little this, mortician guy. This I was like the him. best character in the yeah. film. He, he was fun. He was literally, I think, and I I think he was the the most vibrant, most interesting character in the entire movie and what's interesting as a side note that i was reading is that there was a <clears throat> a sequel to this movie um that that came out a uh, standalone it's called we are what we are it was released like in 2010 and it rep and it's uh the guy reprising the role as the tito the coroner so oh, cool. the guy so it's that it, it, from what I can gather, yeah. it's that character. That's what they built the sequel to this movie. Uh, they built it on his character. Good, because I mean they saw the strength of that character and they knew to build on it, which is I think good. it's the best part of the movie. Yeah, it's it's funny. Like it's funny. It's it works. It's charming. It's uh, even the way that the body disappears. I think is done really well, and it's interesting, and. Um, it's just, it's a cool sequence. I really enjoyed it. <clears throat> he does try to tie in right as uh, Jesus is, is already fallen off the cliff. And it appears like his last words, his last thoughts kind of go to his granddaughter. Like he, he gets the idea. So they do try to tie that back in with that relationship. Cause then they cut to her almost like she's waking up at home and feeling the impact, even though she's miles and miles apart. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they do try to tie it in a little bit again there. And I, I liked the little girl character. I thought she was good. I don't. Does she speak a word throughout the whole film? I don't think she even speaks. She does, and, and it's very, very limited. But I recall her saying okay. a, a line of dialogue or two. Okay, okay, which is is good. I mean, it's fantastic. I think the direction, being able to direct kids, is is a tough job. And especially on your, on your first feature, it's got to be really tough. And I think I think he did a good job with her. He used her. He didn't use her too much. He didn't rely on her too much. I think that's that could have been a problem. But he knew that was the emotional heart of the movie. And I think uh, he used it effectively. I, I would have liked to seen that. Like you said, I would have liked to seen that relationship hammered home a little bit more. But yeah. And, and here's the thing. If <clears throat> if you're bored in this first 45 minutes, at least Tito, the mortician, will will get you through the next 10 minutes because he's fun to watch. And that those scenes are, are funny. I like them a lot. And then you only got a half hour left. And then you got, yeah. And then you're, you're <laughs> you got 25 minutes and you're good to go. Yeah. You'll make it through everybody. You'll power through, but you might ask yourself 10 minutes later, what's the end game here? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, honestly, I thought the first 45, other than Tito, the mortician, I thought that was, uh, that captured my attention the most. Now that's not, to say that it captured my attention, but that's where I was the most engaged. I was like the finale in the third act. I was checked out, man. I, 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 I was doing laundry. I had it on my phone at that point. I was not paying attention really. Well, we got to remember one thing in terms of story, which is uh, the, the uh, Angel's uncle. And so there is some intermittent things as you get towards the end where there's a, a controversy between uh uh hey seuss and and hell's uncle uh the, the two old guys basically um and it just didn't tie together very well for me though like i just didn't care about and hell's uncle too much like it just didn't what was he there for i mean he was trying to show what the possibilities were of the scarab but it didn't translate well no the, there's just something missing it just seems like we're missing something it feels like it feels like a, a big chunk of the movie got cut out. And it's not that you're confused. It's just like it feels like there should be more driving home the plot. And there's just not it's just not there. It's just not connecting. So, yeah, it slows. It slows a lot. It's very yeah. it, especially. And it's funny that you say that because I think that's partly true. You would anticipate as you get towards the climax and towards the end, as you come over that that into that third act, a lot of times you get more intrigued or curious about what's happening in the story or even the excitement level starts to grow 
And it kind of feels like it's the opposite here. <laughs> just boring, man. That's, I mean, it felt like a TV show climax, like a, a, a police procedural climax where you already know what the, the outcome is going to be. You don't really care. Uh, disposable characters. It didn't, it just, I didn't care. It's funny you say that. Cause I wrote here in some of my ideas, which is like, even though, and it does have that kind of made for TV vibe. Yeah, it does. It really does. And what's also interesting to me, and I, it has an 80s horror vibe to it too, but not in the traditional like slasher horror sense. But if you think about like traditional devices and like tropes where they find an artifact and then characters change from a normal world to a, a, a subverted world, a different world, you know, and then it kind of creeps along and tries to build mystery. It does it very slowly, but there's some, and then it's got, then he's sprinkled into me these homage of like old films, you know, talk about film history and like there's homage to like the old, old horror films, like German expressionism in the twenties, where you have like Nosferatu and like, yeah. uh, he's got some sprinkled in homage. So, you know, as a filmmaker, he appreciates the past. Yeah. And, and, and there's some cool stuff too. Like there's, that's the thing is, is, it's not story-wise, it drags on, but there's some cool stuff in here. Like with, with the skin peeling, the, the skin's peeling off. And I thought that was cool. And like you said, the interior shots of the of the scarab and, and the close-ups of the insect in there. And there's some really cool stuff. Even, even Tito, the mortician, there's some butt puckering shots in there. Like when he's about to, to stick the needle through his lip. Like, yeah. it's like, there's some really cool stuff in there. And, and, and so I, I don't want to... I don't want to act like this movie is completely pointless. There's some good things, but it's just not. It don't I mean, if you have HBO Max, just get it there is my point. Because it, it's just, there's nothing that you're going to walk away and be like, that was amazing. Don't Other than, to the rental. Right, exactly. Uh, other than to see the evolution of, of Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro. I think I got it right. You did. You nailed it. I nailed it. But anyway, cl climax. I mean, let's just, let's just move ahead to the climax. Basically... It always ends up Damn on a Alan, get us through this podcast. I know. So I like, I'm, I'm running out of things to say. Uh, it always ends up on a roof and that's, that's where they're at. Uh, I can't even remember what happened to the uncle. He died. I don't know. Something happened to he him. He gets stabbed in the heart. He gets stabbed in the heart. That's right. Um, because he's essentially one of the, he's also been infected by the device or the Kronos. And so he's essentially kind of a vampire too, just like Jesus. Right. And then he ends up getting stabbed or yeah. And, and that, that ends his life. And there is a, an important piece of information that he delivers. And that's to say that if you, if your heart gets stabbed or punctured, that's how you can die. That's the only way you can die. Which has got vampire roots in terms of through exactly. the heart with a stake. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so, and then basically- oh, Can I say one thing, by the way? When, when Anne Hill's uncle, the, old, the other old vampire-like guy, dies and, and he's been stabbed, then Jesus like starts eating his, or drinking his blood, like sucking his neck and like, right. it's all kind of erotic and weird. And then- <laughs> That's cool. Again, that's cool. I but like- It, it works for, yes. Those moments right. are fun. I agree. Uh, because the granddaughter, at this point, we got to remember the granddaughter's there too. So- right after this guy dies and her grandfather starts like eating and sucking the blood of this other guy, her granddaughter, his granddaughters that are watching him. And she's like, Oh, trying to, trying to piece it all together. And then they have a moment where he looks at her because now he's got the, the, the taste for blood and he looks at her and you're thinking, well, they want you to think, uh Oh, is he, is he going to kill her? And obviously yeah. he's not going to, that was never, even a thought that crossed my mind. But I, I think the oh, idea is they do, you're right. They do show him in some way or another resisting the urge to, right. to feast upon the person he loves most. And I think that's when he, out of frustration, uh, smashes the scarab. He smashes the device. Yeah, he gets. Um, I was, a, a, a way I think they could have ended this on a better note, not a better note, not a happier note, but uh, it would have been more interesting is if he would have turned the granddaughter and then they could have gone off and been little vampires together and had that relationship forever. That would have been a cooler ending. Very uh, 
Very Kirsten Dunst, Brad Pitt interview with a vampire. Like exactly, exactly. That would have been a lot more fun. But a side note, I love that movie, so I can I agree. Yeah, with that's you. good. That's good. Otherwise, that would be a better direction to go. I think so, because <laughs> then it then the climax is just it's just dragged out. It's just well, the, here's two funny parts at the end here. Okay. Because after he kills the other old vampire, destroys the scarab. And then Ron Perlman, Jesus is, or not Jesus, Angel's character comes in and sees his uncle dying on the floor. Yeah. Like been okay. Stabbed through the chest. And this, this was one funny part that made me laugh, which is he's like, finally, his, his uncle's like, Hey, save me, save me. And, 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 and Angel's like, no. And he basically puts his boot on his neck and cracks his neck and kills him to ends it out. And he's like, finally, I get everything. And he's talking about all the possible uh, inheritance that he might get, which I thought was funny. I thought it was funny because there's no subtlety. It's just, it's all mine. It's all mine. Fine. It's just like, oh my the acting's God. like completely <laughs> over the top and makes right, not, right. not a lot of sense. And it's right. not done. He is a good actor, but in that scene, it seems off. Right. But then here's the other part to that, the follow-up where uh, Jesus, the grandpa, cracks him over the face with a like a cane or a, a rod or something and breaks his nose and this line because he's already broke this is the second time he's broke his nose in this movie ron perlman's character and has bro- uh, been hit in the nose twice once by his uncle with that same oh, cane i believe right. and then once by jesus using his uncle's cane and when he just and it's when he yells out fuck not my nose again <laughs> Well, when and he it, says that I laughed so hard. I, I laughed. I was like, "Oh man, this is." It was campy. It was so campy. But do you remember at the beginning of the movie, uh, when he first meets uh, uh, Jesus and the granddaughter? It, he's showing he's showing the little the what I don't even know what you call it, like the nose samples, because he wants to get a new nose, right? So he's right, showing. Right. Like, so that's I thought that was a cool little callback there. Um, that, that makes it funnier now that you say that. I didn't think about that originally. I just knew that he broke his nose twice. And right. I thought it was funny that he had, he yelled that. That line to me, I don't know. It didn't even seem like it fit. And we'll get into that <laughs> idea because that's one of my roundups on this movie. It was like, things don't fit. And I'll, I'll explain more. But yeah. basically then there's a, there's a showdown, right? Uh, at the end, they fight each other. And then Jesus grabs uh, Angel and dive bombs off the building with him to, to kill him. Yeah. And then I guess that kills Jesus. I, I don't know. Cause then he's dead. And then, well, here's the thing here. I, we know that Angel Ron Perlman's dead. Cause they couldn't, he couldn't live through the fall, but mm-hmm. here's the thing that I was confused on the idea. And this is what they're trying to build. And once again, I don't think it was as strong as it could have been was that, uh, that Jesus was protecting and saving his granddaughter, right? And from from this, I mean, the build wasn't that great, but the idea is that's what he's doing. So he sacrifices himself, dive bombs off. They both die. The granddaughter's now safe. Uh, Angel's dead. But I don't know that, is is Jesus dead? I don't know. I don't know. They, it cuts, yeah, it cuts to, to the, to the wife and the granddaughter kind of mourning him and it's a sad note and then fade to black. Because the, the grand, if you remember though, the granddaughter, she goes back down the building. So he, they dive bomb off the building. She goes back down and, and we're wrong. She, the Kronos is still there because she grabs the Kronos and puts it in her grandpa's chest. Oh, I thought he smashed it. She tried, I did too. And then I remembered that he doesn't yet. Because he she puts it in his chest trying to bring him back to life. Okay. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? So yeah. she brings him back to life at the end. You were so checked out. You're like, give me the fuck through this. I, I honestly was. I was like, this is I I don't care. Like I just want it to be done. <laughs> because the Kronos is like attached to his chest, and then he does something, and I don't know what it is, like his skin's regrowing, because this is a common theme mm-hmm. where like his skin underneath regrows. And then like his stomach's regrowing an area while the Kronos like sits on his chest. And then after that, I believe is when he takes it and he's already been reanimated. 
mm-hmm. from the Kronos and his granddaughter. This is where also he gets an urge to feast on her. That's right. Okay. And then he takes the Kronos off his chest and then smashes it with a rock. That's right. Yeah. That 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 makes sense. Um. So when does he die? I don't. I don't know why. How did he end up dead? It's funny because I put that in my notes, which is like. I thought he died too, but what it ends up showing, if you remember, is his, if the beginning of the movie, when we saw the alchemist with the stake through his heart, his skin was all marbled white. That's right. Like, like you mentioned, like an old vampire or something. Right. And then at the end of this, Jesus now is lying in the bed and his skin's all like, for lack of a better way to describe it, like petrified white. Right. So I'm assuming he's now dead because the his wife and his granddaughter are now over his body and i'm guessing he's dead although who knows entirely because it kind of just ends right there yeah i don't care i I couldn't care less and the last five minutes you're like get me the hell out of here well and the good news is uh the runtime is a little deceiving because there are like five to six minutes of credits at the end of this thing yeah you're at about an hour 25 minutes so no worries man you that, just get that, to Tito and you're, that, you're golden. <laughs> you get to Tito and you're golden. Um, it's, but again, it's not a bad movie. I mean, trying to come up with my, my score for this was, was kind of tough because I don't want to score too low because that, that, get, that implies that I didn't like it, that, it that, it's, that it's bad, that it's not. Well, I was going to ask you two questions before we get into that because I was going to ask you, which I think we've already discovered, what were you thinking when you finished the film? I was thinking, finally. I mean, what? I was thinking, okay, good, it's done. Not finally, but okay, good, it's done. Um, based from a filmmaker's perspective and from a storyteller, did any of these characters make you angry? And I, by, by that, I mean, did they bore you? Did they excite you? Did you not care? Uh, uh, Ron Perlman kind of... He rubbed me the wrong way in this. Again, some funny moments by him. Some was, intense- was that the character itself or just his portrayal of that character? Uh, I think I think it's just- Or, or both. I think it's just him. Uh, because I think the funny moments, like you said, I'm not sure those were intentionally meant to be funny in that way, the, 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 the two moments you pointed out. But the, the, the one where he's sitting on the bed- talking to his uncle through the, the walkie talkie or whatever that I thought was, I, I genuinely laughed about that on that one. But other than that, I don't know, Ron Perlman, it just, I can't, it's maybe it's just him. Maybe it's the character. I don't know, but he just really rubbed me the wrong way. Okay. And then last question before we get into Google reviews and summation summaries uh, for, for ratings, I mean, and this is an interesting one because I don't, I think we've answered it, but I had it in there anyway. What comment is the author trying to make about the culture uh, of or the theme of this story? Like, what are they trying to say in this movie? What's the thematic message? I just think Del Toro wanted to make a movie and he wanted to put some monsters in it. I think that's the extent of it, honestly. All right, All right. Um, I can go with it. I, my, my main question for you, I had a couple, but we kind of, we hit them as we went through this. My main question for you, we all know, Anyone who's listened to this show knows that, that you have an affinity and a respect for the Criterion Collection. And you have, uh, you picked quite a few movies that are in the Criterion Collection. How has your respect for that collection changed after watching this film and knowing it, that it is a part of it? It hasn't changed. And the reason it hasn't changed is because, well, first off, I'll say this movie doesn't belong there. Totally agree. If you look at what that that collection is now, here's why I'm going to, I'm going to sound bad when I say this, but here's why it's there because it's an international film, right? So it's from a, it's from an independent film from Mexico and done by a, and, and it's a legacy credit to Del Toro. So I don't think originally this is criterion. I think what happens is Del Toro comes out and does some killer films and stories afterwards. And then as a result of his legacy that he's built, they put in Kronos in the Criterion Collection because many of the Criterion Collection are, not all of them, but many of them are from first time filmmakers. 
uh, or their first feature films. So that's what it comes down to. And so it's kind of a grandfathered in based on his portfolio. So why not? And maybe it is on, on there. I don't know. But why not Pan's Labyrinth? I got to read what the criteria is for the Criterion Collection, because there is probably something there. And I can't, I think we've read it once, but I can't remember what it is. Yeah, um, yeah I don't know. I mean, that's obviously a better film, right? It is, is it a studio thing? Does it have to be, do they have to own the rights to it or something? That might One be. One thing I did notice, it could be that, but I also noticed that at the beginning of this film, when they run credits, it's got the, I, I want to say University of Guadalajara. And so there, there, there's a grant there from a film school of sorts uh, attached with probably some grants from the government. So um, it's, it could have to do with that in terms of where money came from or who owns the, the copyright. Like if an educational institute has say in the film or owns pieces of the movie, do you know what I mean? Maybe that's yeah. something to do with it too. I'm not entirely sure, but, uh, but I don't think it belongs there. I'll, I'll say that. <laughs> um, so I, I'm on the Criterion website. Give it to me. And there is, I haven't read it, so I don't know how okay. insightful this is going to be. But uh, in their frequently asked questions, how do you decide which films receive the Criterion treatment? We aim to reflect the breadth of, fil of filmed expression. We try not to be restrictive or snobby about what kinds of films are appropriate. And an auteur classic, a Hollywood blockbuster, and an independent B horror film all have to be taken on their own terms. All we ask is that each film in the collection be an exemplary film of its kind. Of course, we can't just pick movies and put them out. The process of getting right the rights to the to the release of uh, the process of getting the rights to release a film can take years. Even if we want a film, we can't work on it unless the film's owner grants us the rights to do so. So that might be you might be right. Maybe they couldn't get the rights to Pan's Labyrinth or, or whatever. I and, think that's part of it because it's such a big studio, whereas this, like we were saying, is is partly financed and produced by an institute, like an educational right. institute. That makes sense. There's not a whole lot in terms of uh, reviews for this film. I'm not um, surprised. Matter of fact, <laughs> we've just run across the first time ever. If you put on Google and you uh, put Kronos in, and then you look on the right hand of the, the search engine, you're going to notice something I've never seen before. It says, be the first to oh write God. a review. Well, that might be a challenge. They might be challenging you. And uh, you click on audience's review, a big donut. There is no reviews on this film. How disappointing. Should I write a review right now? Yeah, but it's got to be in the style of, of our favorite ones. Well, maybe I won't do it live then because then okay. it'll take yeah. us to take yeah. us a set. Unless you could come up with a couple sentences. <laughs> I will write a review live under my Google name. Um, yeah, I can't. I mean, it'd, it'd be like. Simultaneously, what's funny is I don't want to shit on it too much. Like, yeah. It, yeah. It's the mid, if it was a, if it was um, either something like, uh, uh, the loveless, then I might shit on it. Yeah, the loveless deserves it, but that's it's good. it's not in that category. Or or even worse, your favorite, who's that knocking at my door? Always comes back to that one because it's so bad. Uh, but the loveless, like we we talked about, how I'm gonna forget about this this movie in two weeks. I don't remember anything about the loveless other than I hated it. Yeah, it's, it's not a memorable one. And this falls in line with that. So no reviews to read this time. But what I do want to say, I'll, I'll actually go first on my ratings and then I'll let you kind of <clears throat> wrap it up. Cool. So a couple of thoughts on my end, which is we did a review at the beginning of this, about this time last year on a film called Murder Party. And that ran about uh, 63 minutes, that podcast. We went over and this movie to me falls in line with murder party. And by that, I mean, uh, it's just kind of there. Uh, there's it's, it's aware, like it's aware of what it is. I think murder party actually as a comedy horror 
is more aware of what it is and it's livelier and funnier because it's a comedy, of course, than this film. And the reason I bring that one up is because that's the confusion. I think what I liked about Murder Party as a comedy horror was like he knew what he was doing and what genre he was trying to target. And I think where Del Toro misses here for me is it's he's trying to either he didn't go he didn't specify the direction. What I mean is like he 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 didn't know where he wanted to go or what he was aware of in terms of the world. It, it actually literally, I know he was trying to do a drama, but there were moments that felt comedic in their own right. And so I didn't really attach myself to like this really dramatic thriller slash uh, uh, horror film. And so it felt like a fence sitter. Yeah. Uh, I think it wants to be a serious movie and it's funny and not that serious and more melodramatic. So <clears throat> uh, I liked it from the standpoint of the world and some of the cool creations that were there. I thought, like you mentioned, the acting was good, particularly um, the guy who plays uh, Jesus, the grandfather. I thought he did a great job. He's, he, he's at least one advantage they had was that, uh, Federico Lupi, that's his name. It, it, he's at least able to, to magnetize and, and draw in the camera, you know, because sometimes you put a camera from, in front of somebody and they can't, you don't care. But at least I was interested in his performance when he was on. Uh, so I think for me, uh, that's kind of my summation of it. And so I just wanted to uh, uh, cover that. But I'll give my, my rating and then we'll do the uh, Rotten Tomatoes on IMDb, and then I'll let you wrap it up. So uh, Del Toro is a great filmmaker. Um, I have not seen The Shape of Water. It did remind me of a movie he made called Crimson Peak. I, that's another one I haven't seen. Which to me was like this movie, but better produced. Like it just didn't carry with it a lot of uh, bravado. Like it was just a fence sitter again. Cool creatures cool ghosts, supernatural elements, but the story was blah. And maybe that's better. Maybe he's just a better producer. The writer. I mean, or, I know he wrote these two, but when he's writing someone else's project, yeah, you know, cause he is a great filmmaker and I'm not taking that away. Um, so anyway, that's where I kind of sit on it. This is one that doesn't belong in criterion. And to be honest, like you said, you don't need to see it. Uh, it, or if you do go watch it on HBO Max, don't rent it. Don't rent it, please. <laughs> uh, but if you do, I will say this: be the first to write a Google review. That that is a challenge to put to the listeners. I would love to read what some people come up with. Please, That's people, funny. write a Google review on <laughs> on Chronos. It'd be so funny. So, with that said, I will uh, come in with my my personal rating. It's coming in relatively low here wasn't overly interested i'm gonna go with a 5.2 scarabs cool 5.2 scarabs so here's where we're at imdb 6.7 so not exceptionally high and then if you look at uh, uh rotten tomatoes which is crazy because i think right so 91 percent from the critics 69 percent from the audience so that's still, you know, technically that's certified fresh, right? Am I looking yeah. at that way? Uh, In terms of the, the, well, the critics for sure. Oh no, it's not rotten though. It's not rotten. And, from and the audience. it's not like it's only a couple reviews either. The, the critics, there are 54 reviews on it. And 13,000 from user ratings. So I'm shocked. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty shocked on that one. Okay. Here's, here's how good the movie is, Alan. I forgot what I rated it already. Just like I forgot how the movie ended. <laughs> I'm serious. Did I say 5.2? Scary. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you did. If I didn't, I'm laughing because that's the feeling I had after watching the movie. Yeah. Um, I don't really have anything more to say about the movie. Um, like I said, I hesitate to rate it too low just because it's not awful. You're not, this isn't the room, you know. It's, the craftsmanship's there. The craftsmanship's there. there. There are takeaways. There are things you could look at and say, that is, that's pretty cool. The few and far between, it, it's, 
it's not, I wouldn't even say it's a chore to get through. It's just like, it is what it is. I got nothing more to say about this one. 6.4 broken noses. Go on in a, this is an unusual dynamic. Alan coming in with a full I'm, point ahead of me. I'm going higher. That's, that's great. This is a new one. I think I can't remember the last time we did that. Um, I, I got to go back and, and check our ratings. This falls at the lower end of my ratings. Yeah. This oh, might be the lowest rated film for you. If, if, it, if Loveless beat this, it has to be for, ex, for its uh, eccent, eccentricities. What's the word I'm looking for? It's yeah, just yeah. absolute absurdity. Right. It has to. Anyway, that's uh, Kronos, directed by Guillermo del Toro, also written by Guillermo del Toro, starring Federico Lupi and Ron Perlman. Chronos is a uh, rated R film, runs one hour, 34 minutes, categorized as a horror film uh, with Guillermo's feature, with his feature debut. A mysterious device designed to provide its owner with eternal life resurfaces after 400 years, leaving a trail of destruction in its path. That did is not even close to what this movie was. Just going to say, did any of that happen? Was any of that explained? 400 years, where did that come from? It, it is in there, actually, okay. at yeah. the beginning, but you forgot because by the end, you didn't care. I didn't care. I was done. <laughs> what I was laughing at is leaving a trail of destruction in its path. That would have been so much better. Yeah, darker, more morbid, more slasher, more, more blood. Or more heart, and don't go so dark, or more comedy, and don't try and, you know, there's, he's totally sitting the fence on every way possible. Exactly. Don't sit on the fence, Del Toro. Go make another Pan's Labyrinth. Yeah, please. This is Gabe and Alan with the Tame Aperture podcast. Go check us out at tameaperture.com for previous episodes and for suggestions on future episodes. Until next time, everybody, signing out. The Tame Aperture Podcast is produced by Dutch Angle Pictures in association with Studio B Productions. Listen, watch, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and YouTube.